Okay, so now let's get to tonight. Superman is joining us just off installing new work at a show in New York City and a residency at Lower Cavity in Western Mass. Uh, they are an Indian artist working at the intersections of architecture, sculpture, and landscape. Through research-led, speculative, and site-specific practice, she creates installations that reconsider the values that spaces offer and the ways through which they mediate human relationships. She's interested in conceptions of reality, pleasure, and nature within Eastern practices, and Superman founded Streetlight in 2017 as a collaborative critical research lab that develops decolonial interventions in public space. Her work with Field is informed by the historical vernacular of brass. I think we'll hear about this tonight, all of this. Um, her work with Field is informed by the historical vernacular of grass within rural India, tribal Gond art, and Indian miniature painting. Her background is in architecture, or her background in architecture informs her analysis of public space. Uh, we're already getting into that on the drive from the airport, <laughs> the architecture specific to the place here. Um, Superman is an assistant prof professor of art at the School of Art in S University of Cincinnati. She holds an MFA degree from the San Francisco Art Institute um, and an undergraduate degree in exhibition design from the National Institute of Design in India. Her work has been exhibited at venues uh, far ranging, including the Venice Biennale for Architecture in 2021. United, I'm sorry, Untitled Art Fair, Miami, 2021, the Headland Center for the Arts, the First Presbyterian Church of New York, Shashama in New York, and the India Habitat Center in New Delhi. So let's welcome Superman. Long introduction. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's really nice to be here. I'm going to really try to keep this um, as well paced as I can because I really do want to get to interact and engage and, and be a lot more informal in our questions and discussions thereafter. Um, so forgive me if I sort of pace a little and try to situate myself in relation to y'all. Um, and it's just wonderful to see such a breadth of faces in the room. I, I wish you could see it from, from this side. <laughs> um, and Amanda, if you can give me some uh, time. time tips, that would be extremely helpful. Um, thank you so much for hosting me. Um, and for getting me from the flight and dealing with all the delays today. And thanks everyone for making it through despite this strange weather, um, which is in a way not so strange because climate change. But anyway, <laughs> um, my artist name is Supamrin. I'm an Indian artist working at the intersections of architecture, sculpture, and landscape. I utilize history, specificity, and speculativity as tools to destabilize oppressive systems and center forms for mutualism and collectivity within public space. So, I grew, when I was when I was two years old, my parents moved to to France, and my mom was um, studying. African post-colonial literature and the relationship between India and Africa through her PhD. Um, so I grew up, a lot of my formative years were in a very different country where I didn't know the language um, and the question of language entered my, my consciousness really early in, in, in my life. We moved when I was two. Um, I had to relearn everything and then we moved back to India when I was eight years old and I didn't know a word of English, um, very little Hindi. And um, so my, my sense of myself often comes from an understanding of a place and an engagement with context. When I moved back to India over the course of many years, I became interested in architecture. At that time, New Delhi, which is the capital of India, which is where I come from, um, was experiencing, is still experiencing in many ways, but 
it was very heightened at that time, rapid uh, redevelopment and these new infrastructure projects. And, and you can see how the older parts of the city started to get transformed into a much more homogenized um, steel and glass architecture. I also started to notice um, the ways in which our conceptions of landscape began to get homogenized. And on the left here, you see an image um, of the Franco Gawa Center in Oakland, and on the right, the eucalyptus plantations in Thailand. Um, and I'm interested in, as I've moved away from the practice of architecture into fine arts, I'm interested in a critique, a discourse, a discussion around these spaces, um, around the homogenization of space, but also finding ways to subvert those spaces um, and make room for the other, the other that is always highlighted in this kind of space. And so I really view my practice today as a complex, if we think about um, the Kraust expanded field sculpture, um, where landscape and architecture work together, um, a lot of the tools that I consider in my work are tools that disturb, um, and that is through research, through understanding, travel, engagement, reading, writing, framing, specificity, mapping, experiencing, and tools that entangle, which are locating and relocating, visualizing, speculating, imagining, intervening, proposing, offering, hoping. Much of my inquiry stems from non-Western, non-dual modalities for being and perception. I'm interested in conceptions of reality, pleasure, and nature within Eastern practice. So to give you a very quick overview of how I'm hoping to um, present my most recent project to you today is I'm gonna start right at the current um, I'm going to show a little bit about the latest project that I worked on. Um, I'm going to jump into a case study for the project that, that originated in Oakland. Um, I'll get into a bit of my collaborative work in the expanded practice of field, into our material research, performances, and sculptures. So all that I'm focusing on today is my latest project called Field, which I originated in 2019. So be patient with me. This is all really exciting, juicy new work for me. And um, this, these kinds of conversations really help me also unravel the complexities of what I'm trying to set up. Field is an approach which unites artists, designers, material researchers, and urbanists in exploring grass as material, as texture which, which can be used to transform institutional spaces, as something to weave, dig out, to plant and dance on, as well as its deep history, cultural, social, and economic meanings. Field is a social practice, a generator of labor economies which rely on collective artistic and architectural production. The project promotes environmental awareness through an experiential critique, an open invitation to imagine new structures and materials for a nature-based ethics. So in... Um, Last fall, I was invited to a residency um, in Massachusetts at the site of a historic paper mill building. Um, I was really interested in the space, and on, on the left you can see um, an image of the factory from 1885, and on the right is 
the canal right adjacent to it, which is an image that I took during the time of my residency. And in the context of that space, and we'll get into the nuances of his histories in a little while, I'm thinking of the archive, which is one of the themes for, for this lecture series. Um, and I really do see how my work thinks through that and thinks with that. And I'm thinking, is it possible to identify a corresponding cycle, a rather series of interlocking cycles, which build themselves into the forms of the landscape, and of which the landscape may accordingly be regarded as an embodiment. This means that in dwelling in the world, we do not act upon it. We do not do things to it. Rather, we move along with it. Our actions do not transform the world. They are part and parcel of the world's transforming itself. And that's just another way of saying that they belong to time. And in my experiences, being in multiple places, experiencing dislocation, experiencing alienation, experiencing the city and the landscape and the relationships between these, I've really come to understand these words um, by, by Tim Ingold in relation to how my body shifts and changes to be a part of and apart from the landscape. This is the first um, artwork that I made for the residency. It's called Field Birch. It's a six foot by seven foot wall suspended piece between um, two of the arches, two of the many arches within the architecture of the old paper mill. And the title is Prove It, Day Said Tonight. And night succumbed to the heat of day. There were months where she could not speak on her dark gray light. There were months that the sun shone like blazing fire in the dead of night. Nightless nights we experienced. There were nights when we couldn't dream. Here's a few detailed views of the piece. Um, it's made from two withered birch trees and I worked with a plantation orchard in Holyoke that donated both the grass and the trees for all of these sculptures. The weird, goopy, translucent, dark, smelly material that you see um, entrenched with the birches is a material made from grass. Um, and I'm going to spend a lot of time in the next section of the presentation getting into the details of what and why it exists. This is the second work that I made during the exhibition. It's nine feet tall, four feet wide, um, and four feet deep. It's titled Field Lilac. And what you'll start to notice is that every single artwork that I make starts with field. And I'm not just interested in the individual artworks, but in the peripheral visions that they create as a field of new discourse, as a field of interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary understanding, as a response between art and architecture, as well as my body and the landscape. We are scarecrows hanging on a line. We are bursting tires that fire through a still dry air. We are farmers en route to the fields that direct us through our unpaved trails. We are sizzling overhead cables. We are running milestones. 
a top of flyover, we are the oversized truck that has crashed into us, a gang of buffaloes, and we lie stinking and dead, not buffalo, but corpse. We are sacks of fly ash scattered across this highway, interspersed with our broken, flailing bodies. In 2013, um, I spent a year traveling across my country in India. It was the year, it was a very significant year in my experience and is what ultimately gave me the courage to move from architecture into fine arts. Um, and during my travel, um, I witnessed this accident between the trucks and, and, and the fly ash and the buffaloes and everybody died and it was horrible. Um, and there's moments when I'm here in this, in this landscape that's not mine, in this country that I don't belong to, that will never belong to me. Um, in the tame green grasses where I remember flashes from, from my past and from the alternative spaces that I've inhabited. And I'm thinking about my consciousness, my being that is between these two locations and continuously dispossessed. Those are some more detailed views of the piece. And these are commemorating two lilac bushes that create the formwork um, and the context for the work. The material is translucent, and so the little bits of light that you can see falling through um, is just the ambient light from the exhibition space. Field mirror. This is the third piece that I'm introducing the discussion with today. It's a very low piece. It's only two and a half feet tall and it's horizontal. It spreads itself across the floor. I saw cattle everywhere in this desert. We were oranges and lemons, the oceans of millions that you touched. We wished you would meet us and greet us and sit by us. We wished you would make us as yourself ever changing neon light and we laughed and hated you for it. We opened our markets, we filled them with the things you might desire, things that we would come to desire ourselves. We filled our pockets with your currency, like pimps we sang and danced. This work that is rhizomatic, that is horizontal, that falls apart, that is a being observing itself. Um, I'm thinking about my relationship with you, my desire to become you, and my inability to ever do so. Here's some detailed views of the piece. And I'm, each of these pieces, I'm working with my bare hands um, and the material is wet when I lay it and it slowly dries over days. It has a very specific smell and very specific properties and qualities. It's biodegradable and decompostable. Um, and it smells, I guess, a bit of grass with a bit of vinegar or a bit like compost. Maybe, can you turn it off for me? Um, at the exhibition, we also showcased, and this is something that's pretty new in my practice, um, there's an extensive research process that 
through which I assimilate or seek to assimilate with the landscape and with my context. Um, and I'm now thinking through how those documents exist in a space. So the, the image on the right, where you can see a little bit of the detail, although you probably won't be able to read the text, is uh, um, the juxtaposition of an image I took off the, the nursery and how they store the trees. And it's super weird and interesting because they have this giant graveyard where all the trees that don't make it go to die. And so they're like maybe an acre or two of, of land where these trees that are either sick or on their way out or disused um, go to rest. And that image is juxtaposed with the chapter um, from the first mayor's address to the city of Holyoke as the town was incorporating in 1874. Um, that addresses a lot of the complexities about this agricultural site that had this massive river um, that was dammed that led to the building of this industrialized zone, uh, which has now completely been deindustrialized and is sort of an abandoned city in many ways. In the 18th century, ideas of the perfectibility of nature dominated Western thinking. Humankind would make nature better through cultivation, it was believed, and improvement was the mantra. Orderly fields, cleared, the fo cleared forests, and neat villages turned a savage wilderness into pleasing and productive landscapes. The primeval forest of the New World, by contrast, was a howling wilderness that had to be conquered. Chaos had to be ordered, and evil had to be transformed into good. In 1748, the French thinker Montesquieu had written that humankind had rendered the earth more proper for their abode, with their hands and tools making the earth habitable. Orchards loaded with fruits, tidy vegetable gardens, and meadows grazed by cattle with the ideal of nature at the time. It was a model that would long rule the Western world. Almost a century after Montesquieu's assertion, the French historian Alexis de Tocqueville, during a visit to the United States in 1883, thought that it was the idea of destruction of man's acts in the American wilderness that gave the landscape its touching loveliness. This is a terrific book, The Invention of Nature, uh, by Andrea Wolf, that describes Alexander von Humboldt's sort of ideas on nature that we still today inhabit and interpret. So if this is a theme that any of you are interested in, I highly recommend um, the study. So in towards the, I think end 2018, early 2019 is when um, this study began for me in Oakland. And I was invited on a summer residency um, by a small gallery to um, create a temporary public artwork in this plaza. And this is, Oakland City Hall that you see in the image, the lawn in front of it, as well as the singular oak tree that is the symbol of the city. I was fortunate to be able to access the city's archives, and that meant scoring through hordes and hordes of emails between the architects that redesigned this plaza in the early 90s and the city urbanists and architects that responded to and commissioned the redesign. One of the documents I found was created in 1984, and it was called the Redesign of City Hall Plaza. 
And it basically laid the framework for how this public space was going to be designed in the future. The more I read through the document, and because of my own background in architecture, I know how to read these kind of brief documents and, and see, read between the lines and try to analyze them. The more horrified in some ways that I, I was, um, and right at the onset, the objective is to create an overall design which is formal, understated, elegant, which is, enhances and is compatible with the neoclassical Beaux-Arts design of City Hall. And how to remove all the trees that were existing there so that they wouldn't obscure the important building details. So ultimately, during the redesign, all the trees were removed and a lawn was repl and replaced by a lawn. So my first proposal to the city was just to pause the mowing of the lawn for one season. I was interested to see what emergent, albeit fragile ecologies may still reside within that soil and what might happen if instead of further controlling it and instead of further me now bringing my ideas and the world into the space to just see and witness what was and what is. I became really attached to those clippings and when the time to, came to mow the lawn at the end of the season, I wanted to commemorate them in some way. By this point, I had started to experience my own identity in terms of these insipid, ubiquitous, torn, unseen, dead bits of green. In the United States, lawns comprise over four times the acreage of all other irrigated crops. So if we start to see this as a schematic zooming out problem, and if we start to think about our grasses as crops, which they are, they're often genetically modified, they require extensive water, resources, maintenance and care to grow. Um, and they're pretty terrible for the soil and for the environment. So I wanted to use this material for sculpture. I was fortunate to have and to meet other women that were interested in my work. And over the course of time, um, Jill, who's an industrial designer turned material re researcher. She's now doing her master's in material design. Zenia, who's an architect and urbanist. And Jess, who's a Brazilian performance artist that I went to grad school with. We started thinking about cooking as a form of collective labor. So on the left here, you can see an image of um, the women in the old paper mill in Holyoke. And on the right, you can see how we are thinking about our labor and artistic labor in relation to domesticity, in relation to um, invention, in relation to community. The image, the imagined, the imaginary. These are all terms that direct us to something critical and new in global cultural processes. The imagination as a social practice. Imagination as a form of work in the sense of both labor and culturally organized practice and a form of negotiation between sites of agency and globally defined fields of possibility. 
And this whole movement that happened really in a small studio in Bushwick, DIY, through the pandemic, masks on all the time. I'd never met Jill outside of our working together with our masks. The day we saw each other with our, without masks was like sometime in 2021, and it was nuts to work with someone so closely uh, and not really see, be able to see them fully and develop a different kind of bond with, with them. But all of it was just on this like, idea that it could be something, it could become something, and that together we could make something, and that something was there. But all we experience are failures. For one year, we experienced failure after failure after failure. It was all DIY. It wasn't fancy science labs. It was YouTube research, random science documents from journals, material journals. It was trial and error, trial and error. And we invented this most amazing material. And that's sort of the process of making the material. We collect, so I follow around the lawnmowers at public parks. <laughs> I befriend them, we chat, we hang out. I, they, they tell me where they last mowed and I collect the clippings as they go. And I bring them to my kitchen and I boil them and I wash them and I cook them on my stove and I develop a range of materials that are grass-based, cellulose-based from this process. So to the right, you can see this one is more papery and if you're interested in biomaterial design, one of the first easy tests to, to check is like, can I make paper from it? Because if you can make paper, it means there's like a bunch of cellulose in there and that means it can, you can get it more and more complicated and make something else out of it. And on this side is a recipe that's the most plasticized. And in material design, we, we talk about the process of plasticization as a chemical reaction that takes place, um, which is why you have to cook the material and bring it to boil. So in my recipe, um, it's the starch and the vinegar that are reacting to each other. And at a certain heat, they become pasty. So it's in a way just a more sophisticated version of wheat paste. But it wasn't enough just to make a few materials in a little, whatever those, those Petri dishes are called. We had to start to understand if it, we could fabricate from it what it does. Can it be molded? Can it be extruded? Can it be um, poured? Can it, can it become a sheet? Can it become three-dimensional? So these are images of our first few tests that are still around that scale. You have to remember, we're cooking this in our kitchen. Each time I'm collecting the grass with my hands. Each time I'm making material, we're making like this much material. So it's been a huge progress in terms of the images that I showed before that to be able to get to scale with this material. We also did a residency to um, explore 3D printing this material with success. And that's been like a really exciting test that I definitely wanna revisit at some point. And again, each step of the way, I'm no freaking, I'm no material expert, I'm no 3D expert, I'm no grasshopper expert, I'm no Arduino electronics expert, but together we can, together we do. And so we hacked an extruder that's meant for extruding clay. We wired it with an Arduino. We had a friend build, design an app for it so we could control the speed. And there we go, it was totally doable. Um, in 2021, we 
had, a, uh, had the first exhibition for Field, which was a material design research exhibition. And we showcased all of the various samples and processes that we had discovered during this one year of R&D period. This was the first larger scale test that I made from the material. It was a shit ton of work. Um, and, I, and even though it looks good to everyone else, it had flaws that I was unhappy with. Um, but it was really exciting. So this is about four by four and a half feet. So you can see the jump in scale that we're achieving right there. Um, and the color is from, at that time, we bleached some of the grass and then made two batches. And then we're hand extruding, molding in a three-dimensional curved mold. Um, we also started doing a lot of workshops. And again, these happened very spontaneously. And it was at this moment when I had to make a really big decision. Um, but we open sourced the recipe. So we started teaching other people how to make it. And as we learned how to work with it, the content of our workshops could transform and we could teach not just how to make the material, but also how to work with the material. Also how it shrinks, what are its peculiarities. You have to remember there's no data manual. You can't Google it and be like, how do I solve this problem? And this was and has been a really, really exciting and important part of my pedagogy and my interests and my research. There's often moments when people ask me like very practical questions about the material. Oftentimes the science of it is what is like the most exciting thing to people. Um, I think for me, this liberating from, from closed doors, this opening and sharing of knowledge is really, really important. Uh, and so no, I'm not planning to mass produce it and I'm not planning to make um, common furniture out of it and I'm not planning to close the doors on it. We also though do make collective artworks through these workshops. Um, each of these pieces is about the size of two large tables together, maybe like eight by four. So we arrived at the concept, which actually doesn't stem from us, since the subsistence concept is an old concept, that what we call life production is actually a prerequisite for all types of paid labor. At the time, we stated, without subsistence labor, there would be no paid labor. But without paid labor, there is still subsistence labor. It is the underlying prerequisite for not only every type of life, but also every type of work, that food, housing, and immediate life concerns are taken care of. This work is extremely valuable, but it is never paid for monetarily. That was the point where we saw this connection. And then we also saw that, in addition, housework is not the only type of work that is exploited in this way, at practically no cost to capitalism. Instead, there is similar work among small farmers who everywhere in the world work for their own subsistence. They sell things at the market too, but they aren't wage laborers. And what is interesting about this is that they are just as absent as women are in the gross national product, a gross domestic product. And it was through this very hands-on process of making, literally making something out of nothing, that I came to understand the power in that labor, the beauty in that collective work, in those collective efforts. And the way that this process to me could become a sort of a response to and a push up against specific capitalist structures. Uh, in the art world, in the materials world, in architecture that I was facing. How are we doing on time? About like 15 minutes to get to 50. 
Okay. So I'm going to show you very quickly some of the performances and some of my own sculptural work with this. Um, and I might, I probably would not have answered most things that you'd be interested to know, but maybe it's for the better because then you can just ask me. Um, while I was developing the materials aspect of, of this project, I was still eager uh, to ensure that it wasn't the only aspect being, being addressed. I see how, and I've mentioned it a little bit, how easy it is to, the minute you say science to anything, it's so easily commodifiable, saleable, um, and generates a different kind of interest. But fundamentally, my interest is in the body and is in my relationship with the landscape, with the land. So my collaborator, Jess, who is a performance artist, decided to develop these performance scores with grass. The first one, Braiding Field, which she also did on the occasion of an exhibition on, at Governor's Island, which was purely a braiding off the grass and a meditation on her own heritage and her own identity. Um, she comes from a mixed identity as well, and, and I, I can't address all of it, but um, is interested in like finding that movement within her body. She then started to, she wrote a score for Braiding Field where up to 15 or 20 performers came together and created a shared space. So it, they would be two hour durational meditative, we call them performances, but they're, they're a lot more like body work. Um, and the prompts, in, and we've done them in multiple spaces with slightly different contexts. But just to give you the highlight, the prompts include digging, mending, weaving, breastfeeding, dreaming, singing, and sleeping. And so collectively, we're starting to think about what it means to relate to the land and how we could start to shift those relationships or reflect on those relationships. That's a different site in Cardiff. We did braiding field in the city hall park in Manhattan. And that was a really different context. It didn't look so utopian. It was in such a beautiful meadow. It was a really interesting, really, really hard site to work in. It was the middle of winter, um, and the performers spent three hours braiding the field where there was almost no grass, um, and had pretty severe responses to that process and to the history of the land in that site, which in the early 90s was discovered to be um, as an African-American cemetery. Some of the videos were shown at a recent exhibition, as well as a live performance where performers tore, braided, hummed, and touched the sculptures. Very quickly, to, I'm gonna get into like what it feels like, this, this material. After the time at Governor's Island, I was disappointed. I realized I need to simplify a lot to really understand the material and to stop over controlling it. And so I, scaled down, I said working only with my hands. The image, this one, you can see the material is wet when it's applied, it feels very goopy. It has fibers in it and you intuitively 
want to work with that it wants to be a specific way. And so my goal was to try to understand how it likes to work rather than what are the beautiful forms I want to make with it. I understood that different humidity conditions and different weather conditions would make it dry differently. So in field growth, you can see how the drying process has created these spots and dots and different forms of dehydration that I'm super interested in. I started thinking about them as tools, tools of time or timeless time that, um, that again became layered over and over each other in starting to form a kind of rhizomatic plant-based perspective. And I started thinking about plant-based architectures and what they might mean and what they might look like. And so the grass really became a collaborator in my practice. Um, akin, I started to identify with it, with its alienation from land and my alienation from land, with its horizontality, with its resilience, with its desire and ability to grow anywhere that they would let me. I started to play with bones and dried grasses in terms of rituals that recalled specific moments in my past and in my culture. I started to scale up and play with folds and stuffings and different thicknesses. And it was only through this past year with so much iterative process that I have come to really love and understand and smell and feel the beauty and fragility and strength of this material. So it can be skin-like, it can be bone-like, it can be muscle-like. I'm now interested in thinking about decay in my practice. I want to see these outdoors. I imagine them seeded. I visualize different processes of life and death unfolding in artistic practice. This image is how the material transforms, how that material transforms when it's outdoors left to open to the elements. I'm also thinking about the, my legacy um, during the freedom struggle in India. Women's circles started spinning their own yarn as a form of civil disobedience. Um, we weren't. We were producers of cotton, but the cotton would be taken to England to support the Industrial Revolution and then be exported back as finished product at huge expensive prices that we couldn't afford. And so part of the march of freedom was this idea of self-sufficiency, of making for your own sake what you need um, as subsistence. And I'm thinking about my grandmother and the women in my life that were making this work with their hands. And to me, that's the power of this practice. I'm also thinking more about the safety and how, how I can protect this work from galleries and spaces that are predominantly white institutions that often don't understand the work um, and, and how it might support a more a, a wider network that is informal, that is um, unseen and unnoticed. That's all from me today. Thank you so much.
I think will be, I'm sure, this conversation. Yeah. Thanks for an amazing talk. Um, I was curious when you were showing the images of the sculptural installations in the paper mill. You mentioned for the first two there was a specific number of plants: two birch trees, two lilac, lilac bushes. Is that right? I have a sort of sense of, of what that means to you, but I was wondering if you could elaborate or tell us a little bit about that. I think these are plants that I haven't experienced before this country and that sort of the differences that you see in the landscape. I come from a place with like tropical forests and tropical trees. So it's been like weird to even try to understand what is this, this new material? What is this new space? I'm thinking about the beautiful smell of the lilac and the grotesque smell of my material and what happens when they fuse together and of my identity as this sort of mm, stuck in between the birch and the grass, in between the lilac and the grass. Did that answer? Honestly, it's been both. I think it's been really good for me to, because ultimately it's like also requires me to let go control as an artist, as an architect. We love control. Um, but I had to start from scratch. I had to like start with just my hands. I don't use, I don't use any tools for the most part. I just use how the material wants to flow. As I've scaled up and as I've produced over like 50 pieces in this past year, my understanding has developed so much that I can a lot more intuitively work with it. Um, it shrinks as it dries, it shrinks a pretty solid amount, like 30%. So anything that I do that is like super precise and technical, has to take into account shrinkage, has to take into account its specific unique qualities. The pieces that I made for the show last year were um, the most complicated and sort of structurally stable, sculptural, using more tools than I have before. Um, so it's sort of a mix of both. I, I'm very competent with Rhino and other 3D modeling software. And I had all, all those pieces were made in a month and a half. So I had a very limited amount of time there. So I had planned everything. Um, but then when I went and I had made a lot of sketches and a lot of drawings. And then when I went there, I put everything away and just let myself be free. And I think for me, and often in art practice, I think it is about like that balance between like, when am I overworking a piece or over controlling the piece? How do I let it be itself and let it breathe and yet intervene? So I think that's, that's just like, I love that question because I think about that every day. Indoor and outdoor as well. 
when I when I did the the piece with the arch, it was really exciting, and I felt like it was one of my stronger works um, because it it is in that in between space where it's still really specifically responding to architecture um, and creating a sort of a, a a membrane between two sides, and that was sort of what the piece was titled and alluded to as well. And when you touch it, it feels like skin. It's very soft, um, and it feels like leather. Um, and so it feels like part vegetal, but part animal. It, it's, it's sort of like the plant becoming the meat. Um, and so I am really interested in that. It's, it's interesting because based on the audiences, some people have very different interpretations in terms of, um, in terms of my relationship with India and the forms from India. I really do see a lot of associations with, for example, Mughal architecture and screens that do create these in-between spaces that are about shelter and safety, but also visibility and understanding. Um, so I, I think that its translucency affords that. Um, and also the reason I developed the material to be so translucent is because I'm very interested in exactly the space you're, you're speaking to. Those images that you saw, that you showed earlier of what the landscape used to be and what it's become after it's become homogenized, really changed that idea of alienation, that like um, the, the new growth vegetation isn't the alien, the homogenization is actually the alien. But um, seeing this work after the pandemic, or during the pandemic, however you want to look at it. That phrase you had said, uh, what fragile ecology survived. Um, obviously they mowed it down again afterwards. And there's this, the entire pandemic and everyone shutting down was kind of like globally, socially, we stopped mowing the grass. As you have done these workshops, have you seen more people want to um, re-green space, um, also start drawing more metaphors between like what ways can they stop um, homogenizing their own lives in order to let more natural things work? You know, I mean, yes and no. It really depends, in my experience, it really depends on whom I'm speaking to. Artists, people of color, um, there's some people who feel it and who like are drawn to it and who will like watch a workshop and follow me until such time that I have a workshop and really like get on it and really want to learn and really want to engage. Um, and I think that it's more so like at, sorry for the pun, but at the grassroots that that interest is there. Um, I just was, my work was just dismantled from a gallery in Chelsea um, because they cannot handle that it's organic and that it smells. And, and it's like, I think I'm gonna fight. Like I'm not normally a fighter and I just, you know, I'm like, it's a beautiful world. Um, <laughs> but, but these are moments when You really have to start to rethink who is this work for and where does it function and where should it never be? And I think that's something that I'm getting more um, selective about, um, but also I think it's, it's just, it's just gonna be so many years before white spaces are able to take art that, that lives or breathes. Um, 
So I don't know if that answers it. It's neither here nor there. Um, it's a, a dose of realism that is digestible. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you either close it or somebody has one that they know they want to um, this presentation was um, awesome. Your work is beautiful. Um, and I think of it, my sister, my older sister, is an architecture student who, she's always kind of been like, I'm an architecture student out of spite because I hate, like, these giant towers and all this, like, modernization. Um, so her, I, I instantly, when I started getting that concept of your work sent into her, I was like, you got to check this out. Um, but does, like, this the study and like immersing yourself in like greenery and nature ever make you kind of want to return to architecture to try to incorporate that into more of like, I know you said you had a long journey coming to do arts, but does part of you ever want to go back and try to fight like traditional architectural concepts with this incorporation of nature? If that makes sense. Absolutely. I think like, again, this is a new project that's like, two, three years old at best. Um, but I think that where I, I am going with it is to get to some kind of architecture scale. So it'll never be an architecture necessarily for habitation. I'm not interested in designing bathrooms. Yeah. Um, but uh, I am interested in the response to architecture. I am interested in the strength that this material can have and this approach. It's not even so much about the material, it's about the approach of give me a waste, give me the stuff that you don't care about, give me the aesthetic that you disdain, give me, give me the architecture of compost. Um, so I, each, each project gives me scope to scale up further and to think through those, those conversations without necessarily falling into the trap of like, I have to do it on their terms. Thank you. Cool. That's a great question to end on. Thank you. Thank you guys so much. And I hope some of you will join us for um, what, what is talk it? gathering at Bow and Arrow Brewery, look it up or ask anybody around. And f that's my email. Feel free to reach out. I'd love to be in touch and I'd love to support this kind of work that does require a bit of a learning curve. Thank you.